Hello and welcome to Holy Trinity Church here in Glen Craig this Monday, Thursday for a service of Holy Communion. And we're joined with my colleagues from St. Mary's Valley Bean, uh, the Reverend Jim Cheshire and the Reverend Anna Williams. And so let's worship together. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Return to the Lord God of all mercies for a feast of love has been prepared for his own. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Happy are they who take refuge in him. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. On this night, we come with Jesus and his disciples to the upper room and meet around the table at the Last Supper. The, this Passover meal becomes for us the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood in which we feed in him by faith with thanksgiving. At the supper, Jesus reveals himself as the servant of all. When he takes water and a towel, he washes the disciples' feet, giving us an example of servanthood to follow. And at the end of the meal, we go out into the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane in preparation for the day to come as we walk with him to the cross of Calvary. Our Lord Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Let us confess to Almighty God our sins against his love and ask him to cleanse us. Have mercy on us. O God, in your great goodness, according to the multitude of your compassion, blot out our offences. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Against you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Purge us from our sin and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Amen. Holy, holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Let's join together in singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
Let's pray. Almighty God, at the Last Supper, your Son, Jesus Christ, washed the disciples' feet and commanded them to love one another. Give us humility and obedience to be servants of others, as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us, yet is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading this evening is from Philippians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So reads God's word. And we're now going to join together in singing, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe. Oh, 
for it is Christ we're serving. This is our God, the servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to Our Gospel reading is from John chapter 13 and beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas the son of Simon Iscariot, to portray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Words spoken by Winston Churchill in October of 1942 after the Russians had stopped the Germans in Stalingrad and we had experienced victory in Egypt during World War II. It was a period Churchill referred to as the hinge of fate, the turning point in the war. Up to then everything had seemed to be going wrong and the Allies had been experiencing one defeat after another. But then Rommel was defeated at El Alamein and the tide was turned in the Battle of the Pacific as well. Of course, we know that Churchill was right. Uh, this period only marked an end of the beginning of the war effort for the Allies. The beginning of the end would not come until June 6, 1944, D-Day. In a similar way, the events in our passage this evening mark the end of the beginning and the beginning of the end of Jesus' life and ministry on earth. Right from the start of his gospel, John has been trying to make it clear that all of history had been leading to this one moment in time. In the first half of John's gospel, he tells us how Jesus had spent these last three years of ministry with his disciples, teaching them and trying to help them understand who he was and why he had come, that he was the Messiah and King that they had been waiting for. And 
he showed how he demonstrated this in power as he healed the sick and freed those who were oppressed by dark demonic forces and how he fulfilled the words of the prophets of old. But as the first half of John's gospel comes to a close, we find Jesus now predicting his death. It was the end of the beginning. Now in chapter 13, John tells us that finally the time had come, verse 1. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. For Jesus, it was the beginning of the end. And in what follows, Jesus begins his farewell discourse, his final teaching, which then leads to his crucifixion and then death. Our passage begins with Jesus and the disciples now in the upper room, and they're celebrating the Passover feast together one last time. And as they eat and drink, Jesus begins to share with his friends some parting thoughts about what life in his kingdom looks like. You might want to take time this evening to read the whole chapter uh, before going to bed, because as chapter 13 draws to a close, we find Jesus leaving his friends both then and now with a new commandment to love one another. Interestingly, this is where we get the word bondi from when we think about Monday Thursday. Monday comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means command. Jesus leaves us with a new command that we should love one another. Of course, the, the concept of loving others wasn't new. Back in Leviticus 19 verse 18, God's people had been commanded to love their neighbors as themselves. But in these moments, Jesus takes an old command and points powerfully to a new way we need to look at it. Christ's disciples are to love in the same way that he has loved us, verse 34. But what does that look like? We return to the beginning of our passage where in verse 2, John writes, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end or to the uttermost. And in what follows, we find a picture of what that love looks like. John tells us that Jesus knew the time had come, uh, that the Father had put all things under his power. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? When we think of power and the might of kings, you instantly think of untouchable figures at the top of a ladder who call the shots and, of course, never dirty their hands. But not so with Jesus. Because as the passage continues, we discover that Jesus is going to use his power in a different kind of way, meaning his kingly leadership looks different than the kind of leadership we are so often used to. Time and again, through his ministry, Jesus had taught his disciples about what it means to be great in the kingdom of God, that it takes a humble servant heart. To be great in his kingdom, you had to go down the ladder in order to move up. But he knew they still didn't get it. Uh, not long before this, in Mark chapter 10, James and John are concerned about sitting on thrones at Jesus' right and left hand. And then Matthew chapter 18 tells us there that the disciples were arguing amongst themselves about who was the greatest. And so to drive his point home and to show us what real love looks like, Jesus grabs a basin and fills it with water and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, we need to stop right there because to understand what's going on here, we need to take a closer look. Back in those days, the roads weren't at all, uh, they, they weren't tarmac they weren't clean like we have them now. They were dirt roads. And as you walked along, not only would your sandals have become filthy from the dust along the way, but then there was the animal dirt you had to dodge and navigate as well. And the upshot was that when someone reached their destination, their feet would have been very dirty indeed. Normally, it would have been a servant's job to wash the feet of a guest when they entered a home. Or if the servant wasn't available, someone would have volunteered for the task. What's interesting here, though, as Charles Swindoll points out, is that none of the disciples volunteered for that lowly task. Maybe because they thought it was below them. So the room was filled with proud hearts and dirty feet. Fascinating, isn't it? Those disciples were willing to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. 
I'd say that over the course of time, although our roads have improved, there's not much changed about the human heart. What made things worse here was the timing of it all. The meal had already begun. And again, it's hard for us to understand why this is a problem because the only picture that we have in our minds of the Last Supper is the one that Leonardo da Vinci gave us in his painting with the disciples and Jesus all sitting uh, in chairs at a table while they ate. Again, we might ask, what's the problem here? But back then they didn't eat at tables. The tradition was to eat while reclining leaning on one elbow as they lay on their sides on a small thin pad or a rug covering the floor. Sometimes they would even lean against each other, situating themselves around a low rectangular block of wood on which the food was placed. This eating position meant that if your feet weren't clean, your neighbor would have been very much aware of it. It would have been hard to ignore a face full of dirty, smelly feet. And seeing the situation and knowing that his time was short, we read that Jesus went and quietly took off his outer garments, got a basin, filled it with water, and then began to wash his disciples' feet. On the last night that they would be together before his death, Jesus did the unthinkable and himself became an object lesson to help us to understand what true love looks like. It's wrapped up in Christ-like humility. Again, we struggle to comprehend this because when we think of kings and kingdoms, this isn't the picture of a king or queen that comes to mind. For I, I can imagine that none of us would believe it if our own queen were to do something like this. But the point that Jesus is making in this chapter is that this is how we are to love others because this is the way God loves us. One of the passages we often read at this time of the year helps to fill out the picture. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, we read, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's shocking that the God of the universe would empty himself of his power and shrink down, down, down into a baby to then grow up and live to show people the love that he had to them and then the full extent of that love by going to the cross. It's almost unthinkable, leaving the glory of heaven behind and becoming, uh, being born as a, a human baby. Well, that was humility enough, surely. But to live for that one purpose, that he might go to the cross and experience the death of the damned for you and for me. Well, that's humility at its most extreme. Through both of these passages, we clearly see the servant heart of God. You see, a lot of people get confused when they read Philippians chapter 2. As John Ortberg in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, points out, it's tempting to think. The, what Paul means here is that we should be like Christ, who despite the fact that he uh, was in nature God, poured himself out and took on the nature of a servant. For you and me living in a pride-mad culture, that sees downward mobility as utterly offensive, that kind of understanding would make sense. But when Paul uses the word being, when he says being in very nature God, what he's trying to teach us is that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who precisely because he was in very nature God, poured himself out and took on the very nature of a serpent, which of course, makes even more clear what we find here in John's Gospel. Interestingly, in ancient Greek mythology, it was said that Zeus and Hermes also came down to earth for a brief time and disguised themselves as servants, as poor slaves. Uh, they did this so that in their disguise, they could go around and see just how much humans were really worshiping them. 
when their research was done, they then threw off their rags, revealed themselves as the gods they really were in all their glory. And as Ortberg again points out, it was like Clark, Kent, and Superman all over again. They took on the outward form of a servant, but that was just a disguise. But this is not what Paul is talking about here. It's not what he's saying in Philippians chapter 2. Nor do we see that in Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet. Jesus didn't just take on the outward form of a servant as a disguise. When Jesus came in the form of a servant, he was not disguising who God is. He was revealing who God is. In other words, Jesus did not come as a humble servant in spite of the fact that he is God. He came as a servant precisely because of the fact that he is God. And now Jesus tells us to go and do likewise. You can only imagine the disciples' horror in that moment as they see their master, their Lord, humiliating himself before them, dressing like a slave and then doing the job that only a slave would do. We see it in Peter's reaction. No, you shall never wash my feet. But of course, the disciples didn't realize that Jesus' act of love was so symbolic, so full of meaning that it simply had to be done and it had to be received and accepted. As we close, this is the first point that I want us to take away with us. Christ's love was individual. It was poured out on each person in the room that night, and it symbolized the washing that only Christ can do in our lives through the cross, as well as the great need that we all have for that cleansing. Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus' washing of their feet foreshadowed Christ's own death the next day. Just as that water was being poured out, he would pour out his own life on the cross for them. But each of them would need to receive that love individually for themselves. Which begs the question, have you received Christ's love for yourself? You have to choose. Have you received what Christ has accomplished on the cross for yourself. But Jesus then turns the symbolism around in verses 14 and 15, and he shows them how this act could be an example of how we are to live every day if we want to be followers of Christ. And here we see that Christ's love was, so, was, was costly and it was also sacrificial. In his actions, Jesus was revealing himself as the servant king. And through his words, he calls his disciples, both then and now, to be like him. He calls us, if we want to follow him, to let go of our pride, to let go of our me-first attitudes, as well as our constant striving to climb up the ladder of upward mobility in order to find greatness and self-worth. And in true humility, he calls us instead to take up the ministry of the towel and following in Christ's footsteps to serve others in costly, sacrificial ways as well. Ways that go against the grain of our culture and put the needs of others before our own as we serve them and point them back to Jesus Christ. Among other things, this means that we will need to radically rethink how we see ourselves and how we see others, which will in turn impact how we live and treat people on a day-to-day basis. Walking in Christ's footsteps and taking up the ministry of the towel means humbling ourselves enough just to see how small we are before God and what true greatness actually looks like in His eyes as we put the needs and priorities of others before ourselves. It will mean bowing low with Christ as we submit our will to God's will and to His way, as we learn to love one another as Christ has loved us. How we do this will no doubt look slightly different for each of us, but it will have the same flavor in each case. For instance, taking up The ministry of the Tao will mean learning to serve others without expecting or needing praise or recognition in return. It will involve self-denial. 
It says, I'm going to sacrifice my time and my energy and my efforts and my money in order to see someone else's needs met. Those needs might be practical ones. Painting, fixing things up, serving coffee, uh, cleaning up afterwards, or so on. They might be spiritual needs. Bearing one another's burdens, supporting one another through pain and sorrow, through prayer and friendship. Even when you find the other person difficult or awkward to deal with. There are, of course, needs that we all have. And Jesus says that the world will know that we are his disciples if we love one another. And that doing that involves sacrificially meeting one another's needs, especially within the church, the body of Christ. Washing each other's feet involves actively making time and our schedules to meet the needs of others as they arise. It will involve interruptions in our daily lives, but it also means actively making time in our schedule to participate in specific ministries in our churches. As the body of Christ, each of us has a part to play. Each of us has a role to fulfill in order to be the people that God has called us to be. I wonder what yours is. Because church is not a spectator sport. And therefore, part of being a disciple of Christ is giving your time over to God and asking him to redeem it for his kingdom. Taking up the ministry of the towel is not easy work. But this is what Jesus commands us to do when he says, a new command I give to you, love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you in your grace and mercy for sending the Lord Jesus Christ into our world at just the right time, while we were yet sinners to die for us. Father, we thank you for his humility and grace. Lord Jesus, we thank you for completing your mission, for going the whole way and loving us to the very end, to show us just how great the Father's love for us truly is. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And as we look to him now, we ask that you would help us to learn from him And we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to live for him as well. Help us to believe in Christ and to receive all of the goodness, the forgiveness, the grace and mercy that you pour out on the cross to us through him. And Father, give us that grace and strength we need to live for him day by day radically rethinking the way we live and the way we look at others as we seek to love others as indeed you have loved us. And we pray that as we do, that love would be contagious. It would be infectious. That people would look in and see our love for one another and they would see Jesus. That all would know that we are followers of Jesus because of our love for one another that many would come to see Jesus for themselves and they too would be saved. Thank you for Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that our servant King has won the victory on our behalf. Help us to live for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We know that he was with them in the upper room, so our Lord is here with us now. Until the kingdom of God comes, let let us us celebrate celebrate this this feast. feast. Blessed our Lord God of the universe, you bring forth bread from the earth. Blessed be God God forever. forever. Blessed our Lord God of the universe, you create the fruit of the vine. Blessed Blessed be be God God forever. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift lift them them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It It is is right right to give give our thanks and praise. 
Father, Lord of all creation, we praise you for your goodness and your love. When we turned away, you did not reject us. You came to meet us in your Son, welcomed us as your children, and prepared a table where we might feast with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He, he opened wide his arms upon, upon the cross, cross and, and with, with love stronger than death, he made, made the perfect sacrifice for sin. sin. Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, on this night before you died, you came to table with your friends, taking bread, you give thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, we, we bless, bless you. You, you are, are the bread, bread of life. life. At the end of supper, you took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Lord Jesus, Jesus, we we bless bless you. You You are are the the true vine. vine. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dying, Dying, you destroyed our death. death. Rising, Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Holy Spirit, giver of life, come upon us now. May this bread and wine be to us the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us who know our need of grace, one in Christ, our risen Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless Trinity with your whole church throughout the world. We offer you the sacrifice of thanks and praise and lift our voice to join the song of heaven, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. Amen, amen, amen. amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and and the the glory glory are yours, now and and forever. forever. Amen. As often as we break this bread and drink this cup, we we proclaim proclaim the Lord's death death until he comes. comes. Jesus, Lamb of God, have Have mercy mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have have mercy mercy on us. us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant grant us peace.
Let's pray. O God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has left us this meal of bread and wine in which we share his body and his blood. May we who celebrate the sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join together in singing, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my.
is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thank you for joining with us for Holy Communion this evening and thank you to Jim for preaching. We we're really grateful for uh, partnership in the gospel and please do join us for our online services tomorrow here in Holy Trinity Church at noon. We have a service online or perhaps we'll see you on Easter Sunday in person. And thank you to uh, Catherine for inviting us to join with you this evening in this special service. And I just want to say a word of thanks on behalf of the people of St. Mary's Belly Bean uh, to you, our brothers and sisters here in Glen Craig. Uh, and just want to say thank you for uh, allowing us to use your facilities for doing recording while we're doing our refurbishment works in St. Mary's over these past months. Uh, we too will be holding our Good Friday service. Ours will be online tomorrow evening, a service, a meditation for Good Friday. And then on Easter Sunday morning, uh, we would love for folk to join us as well for online uh, Easter Sunday service together. And then we're meeting together in person Easter Sunday evening at 7 p.m. And that will be held at Dundonald Methodist Church. When the disciples had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus prayed to the Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me. He said to his disciples, enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. <laughs> 